It all started with a question on the lips of a 14-year-old boy from Sharon, Vermont. The story goes that in 1820, a religious seeker named Joseph Smith secluded himself in a grove of trees. He knelt down to pray, asking God which of all the churches were true. Suddenly, a pillar of light penetrated the forest and two heavenly angels appeared to the young man. They told him that none of the religions on earth were true, that mankind was lost in a great apostasy, and that God had been waiting for this young boy to restore mankind's truest religion, Mormonism, to the earth. So the boy did just that. Joseph Smith founded one of America's biggest and most prolific religions, Mormonism. As Mormonism grew, so did Joseph Smith's vision for what the religion would look like, practically and on the ground. As his following grew, so did their critics, often upset at the growing group for their secrecy and their strange and controversial doctrines. No doctrine has caused Mormonism more trouble than their views on family. As Joseph Smith experimented with new theological ideas influenced by frontier poverty and the Great Awakening, it wasn't long before his doctrines got bigger and bolder. By 1844, Joseph Smith had amassed a following of over 10,000 people and an inner circle of several hundred of his most loyal believers. It is in that circle that Joseph's most sacred doctrines were instituted. The most sacred doctrine of all was plural marriage. The idea that certain anointed and righteous men had been called by God to practice polygamy in secret. Joseph Smith would go on to marry at least 33 women. Joseph Smith's legal wife, Emma Smith, helped him found the religion. She was there by his side throughout all of it. And when she was introduced to his new strange doctrine of plural marriage sometime in 1843, she rejected it bitterly. Joseph Smith is said to have presented her with a revelation transcribed directly from God, ordering her to accept polygamy as ordained by God. Emma Smith responded by throwing the revelation in the fire. As you can see here, these are the scriptural dictates given to Emma, telling her that if she did not submit to this doctrine, not only would she be destroyed, but that in the next life, her husband would receive many more wives than she would ever accept on earth. What Emma didn't know was by the time that she found out about this doctrine, Smith had already secret, secretly married over a dozen women behind her back. This is a list of the most documented wives that we know about. Again, the list, it goes up to 55 women, but these are ones that Todd Compton uses in his book, In Sacred Loneliness, that are easy to document, and this is the list of their names. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about a few of them. These are the Partridge sisters. On the left is Eliza, and on the right is Emily. In 1840, Joseph, Smith, tr Joseph Smith's trusted bishop, Edward Partridge, died, leaving his children without a caretaker. Two of his daughters, Eliza and Emily, were particularly vulnerable. Emily was only 16 years old when she and her sister Eliza were invited to act as maids in the Smith's household. Emily's job was to take care of Emma Smith's new baby. She loved it. She grew to enjoy the Smith children and become friends with Emma Smith. And after a year of her time with the family, Joseph Smith brought her into a room alone and told her that God wanted her to be one of his secret wives. He presented her with a secret letter, which he asked her to burn after she read. Emily would later write, quote, I began to think that this was not a proper thing for me to do, and as I was about to be miserable as I ever wish I would be, I went to my room and knelt down and asked my Father in Heaven to direct me. I could not speak to anyone on earth. I received no comfort till I went back to say I could not take a private letter from him. He asked me if I wished the matter ended. I said I did. He said no more to me for many months. 
Though this invitation bothered her, she did keep it secret. And like many of these invitations, they were done in secret and with a threat of a penalty that not only if she found out, or if she told someone that it would destroy her reputation, but it would also destroy his. He often reminded women of the care and charity that he was offering them, especially the Partridge sisters who depended on the family for their income and their well-being. This could not have been an easy decision to say no to, but she did. Joseph Smith was unfettered and sent older women like Elizabeth Durfee, who were already initiated in the secret order of the wives, to convince Emily and her sister Eliza to join the group in being sealed to Joseph Smith. At this time, Emily and Eliza had been both approached by Joseph Smith, but didn't know that the other had been. Again, when Emily was approached, she resisted. So Joseph made another attempt when she turned 19. It was on her birthday that she says, quote, he taught me this principle of plural marriage, but we called it celestial marriage. And he told me that this principle had been revealed to him, but it was not generally known. Not, respond not responding, a week later, he sent one of his Mormon leaders and trusted counselors, Heber C. Kimball, to invite her to his home. Emily writes, quote, when I got there, nobody was at home but the Kimball children, William and Helen Kimball. I did not wait long before Brother Kimball and Joseph came in. It was then that Heber and Joseph sent the children away, and Heber goes into the room with Emily alone. She says she heard Brother Kimball say, Emily, Emily. And he moves her to a private room. Soon after, Joseph Smith enters the room. And she says, quote, I cannot tell all Joseph said, but he said the Lord had commanded him to enter in plural marriage and had given me to him. Although I had got badly frightened, he knew I would yet have him while well, I was married there and then. Joseph went home his way and I went my way alone. A strange way of getting married, wasn't it? Soon after, Emily's sister Eliza would be married to Joseph as well under similar duress. Though the girls took several turns sleeping with the prophet at homes other than Emma's, for which they still worked and cared for her children, eventually Emma Smith found out that, that Joseph had been marrying women behind her back. She did not know he was secretly married to the Partridge sisters yet. The doctrine was very difficult for Emma to resist. She fought it. Uh, lots of accounts say that she went back and forth between rage and despair. And at first, Emma reacted with great resistance, but eventually relented to allow Joseph Smith to marry women if she could be the person choosing who they were. So she chose the two Partridge sisters, believing that they were loyal to her and not interested in Smith, and perhaps believing that she could have some control over her household since they lived there. Little did she know they had already been married for some time to Joseph Smith secretly, they had all already spent the night with him several times. Still, Emma stood by as Joseph and the Partridge sisters performed a mock marriage with Emma there resentfully. It changed things forever for these sisters, both who expressed regret for how this went down. Soon, even though Emma had initially agreed her heartbreak was too much to bear, Emily says, quote, we, we remained in the family several months after this. She sent for us one day to come to her room. Joseph was present, looking like a martyr. Emma said some very hard things. She would rather her blood would run than be polluted in this manner. Joseph came to us and shook hands with us, and the understanding was that all was ended between us. I, for one, meant to keep this promise I was forced to make. Of course, after this happened, they continued on to be plural wives with Joseph Smith.
Gott schon.
to me, if you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. No. 
Similar stories of pain and secrecy surrounded Smith's other polygamous unions, especially ones that involved underage wives like Helen Mar Kimball. Smith asked his own counselor, Heber Kimball, to give up his 14-year-old daughter, Helen Marr, as a wife. This is a picture of Helen Marr in her older age and a rendering an artist did of her as a child. Helen Marr Kimball was the daughter of some of the most loyal, trusted associates of Joseph Smith. Heber Kimball, her father, was deeply loyal to Joseph Smith and willing to do just about anything for him. According to Helen Marr, quote, Without any preliminaries, my father asked me if I would believe him if he told me that it was right for married men to take other wives. The first impulse was anger. My sensibilities were painfully touched. I felt such a sense of personal injury and displeasure. For to mention such a thing to me, I thought altogether unworthy of my father. And as quick as he spoke, I replied to him short and emphatically, no, I wouldn't. This was the first time that I had ever openly manifested anger towards him. Then he commenced talking seriously and reasoned and explained the principle and why it was again to be established upon the earth. This had a similar effect to a sudden shock of a small earthquake. Heber then, quote, asked me if I would be sealed to Joseph and left me to reflect upon it for the next 24 hours. I was skeptical one minute, believed, then doubted. I thought of the love and tenderness that he felt for his only daughter, and I knew that he would not cast her off, and this was the only convincing proof that I had of it being right. I knew that he loved me too well to teach me anything that was not strictly pure, virtuous, and exalting in its tendencies, and no one else could have influenced me at the time or brought me to accept a doctrine so utterly repugnant and so contrary to all of our former ideas and traditions. Helen Marr was 14 when her father approached her with this idea. Unknown to her, Heber and Joseph had been discussing this idea for a while after Joseph put the Kimball parents in a sort of Abrahamic test where he asked Heber to give up his wife to Joseph Smith as a test. The two were in agony about it, but finally relented. And Joseph told them as a reward, it was only a test and he wanted to marry Helen Marr instead. Helen often talked about resentment later on to how this went down, even though she did believe it was a doctrine, she resented it. She believed her father did it because he had a great desire to be connected with the man he saw as a prophet of God. So she said, quote, he offered me to him. This I afterwards learned from the prophet's own mouth. My father had but one ewe lamb, but willingly laid her upon the altar. For many years after Helen Marr would struggle with depression and a lot of mental health issues, she recalls as a teenager in Nauvoo being prohibited from socializing with men or peers her age because she was already considered taken by the prophet. Sometimes in modern history, Mormon scholars will debate on if their unions were sexual or not. And I always say it doesn't matter because her life was um, reserved and sort of taken as if it was anyway in, in the Victorian times. And she certainly felt that way forever after. Even as she died a faithful Mormon, she expressed regret for this doctrine and practice. No, 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 no. Lo 
Lucy Walker was another underage girl who found herself vulnerable and in need of care. When she and her family moved to Nauvoo, she was a young teenager. Her mother contracted the deadly malaria from the swamp surrounding the area. Lucy's father was sent on a two-year mission, essentially leaving his surviving children orphaned. At age 15, Lucy was given an invitation to work inside the Smith household to provide a living for herself. And here's what she writes, quote. In the year of 1842, President Joseph Smith sought an interview with me and said, I have a message for you. I have, com I have been commanded of God to take another wife and you are the woman. My astonishment knew no bounds. This announcement was indeed a thunderbolt to me. He asked me if I believed him to be the prophet of God. Most assuredly, I do, he replied. He fully explained to me the principle of plural or celestial marriage, said this principle was again to be restored for the benefit of human family and that it would prove an everlasting blessing to my father's house. He asked her what she thought about that. And she said, how could I speak or what would I say? She responded with nothing. So Joseph Smith did what he did to many of his wives. He asked her to pray, reminded her that it, there were penalties attached to this, and that God would destroy people who weren't obedient. She writes, quote, that she was tempted and tortured beyond endurance until life was not desirable. Oh, that the grave would kindly receive me, that I might find rest on the bosom of my dear mother. Why? Why should I be chosen from among thy daughters? Father, I am an, only a child in years and experience, no mother to counsel, no father near to tell me what to do in this trying hour. Oh, let this bitter cup pass. And thus I prayed in the agony of my soul. Joseph told Lucy that the marriage would have to be secret, but that he would acknowledge her as his wife beyond the Rocky Mountains. He then gave her another ultimatum that if she didn't do this, if she didn't decide yes by tomorrow, that the gates of heaven would be forever closed to her. And now you have to remember her beloved mother had passed away in what she believed was heaven. So he was telling her that if she didn't say yes, she would never be with her mother again. This is something that weighed heavily on her. She wrote, this aroused every drop of scotch in my veins. I felt at this moment that I was called to a place to place myself upon the altar of a living sacrifice, perhaps to brook the world in disgrace and incur the displeasure and contempt of my youthful companions. All my dreams of happiness blown to the four winds. This was too much. The thought was unbearable. She spent the entire night sick and pacing the floor for an answer. She would pray and agonize over the decision before the deadline was over. It wasn't just her temporal situation that would be affected by her answer. She was working for the Smith family. They literally paid her way. She also believed her eternal salvation was jeopardized as well. It was in the early morning hours of that night that Lucy, quote, received a powerful and irresistible testimony of the truth of the marriage covenant called celestial or plural marriage. And I afterwards married Joseph as a plural wife and lived and cohabitated with him as such. As you can see, she talked about it in, in the aspect of sacrifice, the altar of sacrifice. This idea that you must lay yourself on the altar of sacrifice remains today.
for you. I have been commanded by God. I have been commanded by God. So take another wife.
Joseph Smith's life was cut short at age 38. His doctrine of secret wives was the worst kept secret in America. Newspapers printed rumors from neighbors and dissidents of Mormonism. Critics openly attacked Joseph Smith for the secret practice and grew concerned as Mormon, Mormonism gained power and popularity. Eventually, Joseph Smith would be arrested and murdered by an angry mob. His death at the hands of vigilante justice made him a martyr that would live on and become one of the world's biggest American religions. But this isn't the story about Joseph Smith. This is the story of the hearts that were broken and paid a bitter price. Forever after, these women would be venerated by Mormons alike until the mainstream church, the mainstream LDS church, moved away from the practice officially in 1890. From doing that, these women's names and histories became slowly erased until the practice of Joseph's plural marriage or celestial marriage became conflated with something completely different. But over the 487 extant expressions that come out of Joseph Smith's tradition all over the world, many of those groups still practice polygamy or plural marriage. This idea and doctrine has led, led to countless suffering and heartaches on the price of men and women alike. 
women often, modern day polygamists often talk about placing their own hearts on the altar of sacrifice. When we think of the legacy of a religious tradition that has shaped America, we can't think about it without remembering the bitter price that so many women have paid because of it.
guys to be able to make sure that you guys were always going to stay on pitch, especially like during those dissonant chords? <laughs> that was one of the cool things for me. Is I was like, wow, they're just solid on that. That's <laughs> <laughs> and those are hard chords to do. So anyway, just thought I'd ask how long did that take? Were you guys just? I think it was an hour. No big deal. <laughs> I think most of us have multiple degrees in this, so we've been practicing for a long time. Well, so you just blown my mind, and it was easy. Uh, I think sure. we had four, we have four <laughs> rehearsals all together, I think. Okay. Um, so just a lot of intensive drilling of our parts before that, and then putting it together was exciting and challenging. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and a, really, well a, really, a really good conductor with a really good ear. Yes, yes. yes. also that. <laughs> A score that was difficult but also yeah. doable. That's a, that's a fine balance to strike. Yes. 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 Um, are, I'm curious um, if any of you have an LDS background. Um, okay. And, and so, I, I mean, I don't know if all of you want to speak to this, but I'm curious how that impacted your engagement with the material? Um, so I grew up in the church. Um, I, I kind of navigated my way a couple of, like, I'm, I'm, I no longer consider myself Mormon um, for a few years now. But um, it's, it was hard. I don't think I really got a handle on the emotional part of this music until yesterday. Um, when I finally, I finally heard, um, Lindsay's narration of, you know, of all the, sto of these stories of these women and my heart felt heavy because I grew up in this religion, um, believing a lot of things and believing a lot of different things. And then hearing these stories, it just stings me. It hurts me. So um, it's a hard piece, but it's a piece that I think a lot of people need to hear. That's my personal experience. Um, I'm actually descended from Elvira Ann Cowles, um, who is one of the women's names we said, who was sealed to Joseph Smith and um, Polly Andersley, actually. She was already married, and then she was sealed. Joseph. Um, and so for me, um, having grown up in this tradition and also having navigated away from it for a few years now, based a lot on how women, for my experience as a woman, I felt like a second class citizen. Um, it's been um, definitely asked me to look at things that I kind of put on a box put in a box on a shelf for a little while and hadn't looked at in a while. And um, as I've worked on this piece, I have felt the women that we are talking about, I felt them near. And I felt the power in saying their name, their names, and bringing those to light. So I'm really grateful for this experience because of that. really quickly um, it's been interesting to look at this piece from the perspective of a gay man um, and going what truck do I have with this but also having pioneer history and polygamy in my family history and and, uh, and, and listening and being part of conversations with women today who are still grappling with the practices that happened then and and going, how do I help? Yesterday I was angry and I think, okay, I'm just sad. So it's been a massive project and I'm grateful to have been part of it. Experience 
coming into yeah. this, if you're willing to speak to that. <laughs> I think I'm the only outlier. Yeah, I, I was raised Catholic, and I'm from Wisconsin, so the um, LDS Church and Mormonism is very new to me since I moved to Utah, um, and just learning about polygamy and what it really was um, for these women while we were working on this piece has been very humbling, and I'm just very grateful to be a voice to the voiceless um, and to share their stories. I guess I'm kind mm -hmm. of in between, because I was not raised LDS, but um, I have a pioneer in polygamy in my family history. Um, but I don't really, I didn't really know, and I, I still don't know very much about that history. And I was actually trying to like untangle some of it on, on ancestry. It's my dad's side of the family and I don't really know very much about them, but they go all the way back to, um, you know, the, the, some of the first people, not, not any of these folks, but, um, and, I, and I don't know who I'm related to <laughs> because the, the women aren't listed there in the same way and so um i i think that i have been reading you know the, the todd compton's book and um you know it's it's a part of um utah history that i i'm really grateful to like be learning about i think it's important and um yeah like mandy was saying it's just like i i think about them all the time as we've been practicing as we've been practicing this and, yeah. and learning it can i add something i'm um um I am in the Mormon tradition, so sorry, I should have said this before. Um, I think that truth, no matter how hard it is, is truth and it needs to be said and recognized and known. And we are so lucky to be in art, which allows us to handle these incredibly hard truths in a way that we can move forward from them. Um, so. Thank you for writing something that helps us grapple with this hard truth and continue on and know what we need to learn from it. Sure. So I was actually in grad school when I started learning more about, um, you know, early church history of the uh, Mormon church. Um, and I learned a lot of things, and one of those being uh, polygamy. And I actually started with Lindsay Hansen Park's podcast, Year on Polygamy, Year on Polygamy, which I highly recommend. Uh, it goes through every single wife, uh, one episode at a time. Um, and then she led me to Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness, which is just like incredible. Um, ate that up. And then I learned that you can actually request like the journals. Uh, I did it digitally because it was during COVID from the Pioneer History Museum across from the Capitol. Uh, so you can get access to most, most of them. And there's a surprisingly large amount of text. Um, and so I was just, I was learning this and reading this in grad school um, and just couldn't stop thinking about them and their words. And it's just, you just, as you know, a Mormon, you, you identify with their feelings of wanting to do so good, of wanting to be so good, but feeling like they, in their minds, were constantly falling short and the guilt that they felt of, of falling short, but wanting to be so good, they felt guilty that they, struggled with polygamy. They felt guilty that they didn't like it, um, that they should like it, that it's this, you know, celestial, um, quote, necessary to exaltation. Um, and uh, it just, and because I'm in art, I just, in grad school, I, I started writing pieces about the stuff I was learning just to kind of help process it. Um, and that's kind of how this piece came to be. How long did it take you to write this? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was supposed to premiere and like, I think I got the call to like write the piece like after, shortly after I graduated, like 2019 still. Yeah. Started writing it in 2020 and uh, 
the 20, end of 2022. Uh, it took me about a year probably uh, on and off uh, dealing with like the stress of COVID and like trying to be creative during all of that. So it was kind of a touch and go situation, but um, probably about a year. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, enjoy your evening and uh, we hope to see you again at the next, next ensemble concert. Thank you.